yeah so my name is austin i'm a first year phd student so uh thank you uh for giving me this opportunity to present some of uh, my work uh, that i did uh, during my uh, master's uh, dissertation yeah um so this work is uh, based on the irax project and um, yeah and this is a list of the inst institution that is currently uh, collaborating with irax uh, they are both uh, local and uh, international institutions so um irax is a new radio interferometer project uh, so we are cu currently located at uh, at atrau so that's 100 uh, kilometers um, away from uh, johannesburg so we currently have eight dishes, um, yeah, and we that's the eight eight, uh, eight dishes, and we uh, added like two additional uh, dishes so so that we can refine our uh, for ref re refine our purposes. So the, this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the IRAX project. So we will take you to uh, I'll uh, describe some of the science uh, goals. And then I'll also try and talk about the uh, IRAX design specification. Then I'm going to uh, talk about my work. Um, this is basically uh, deploy, deploying, uh, this is basically de de deployment and testing of the IRAX instrument. So um, where I perform LNA and RF over fiber uh, characterization. And then I'll also share some of the works that uh, our collaborators have been doing so that's some antenna simulation and then I'll, I'll walk you through a, a system integration yeah so uh, the irax as uh, uh, main this irax main uh, science goal is to measure uh, bios so using the 21 intensity mapping technique uh, so that we can characterize uh, dark energy so um, another, uh, we also plan to study radio transients and pulses so that we, and also we plan to localize uh, FRPs. So those are the major uh, 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 science goals for IRAX. So uh, this is a model that dis uh, describes the evolution of the universe. Uh, so right from the infl inflation uh, era to the dark energy dominated era. And uh, so we all know that the universe expansion is accelerating and that expansion uh, is, uh, that, uh, that acceleration that expansion is happening at an accelerating manner. But one thing we uh, clearly, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's happening at an uh, accelerating manner. That, and, and one thing that is causing that is uh, dark energy. But one thing that we still don't know and uh, that still remains an history is the nature of this dark, dark energy. So IRAX is, um, is planning to precisely measure the the uh, the late expansion of the un universe uh, and they'll do will do this by uh, measuring the the baryonic acoustic oscillation using the 21 centimeter intensity mapping so um this is an artistic impression of uh, of irax when it will be fully instrument in instrumented uh, at uh, karu so we plan to have 1024 uh, dishes um, so the IRAX uh, instrument design is uh, determined uh, by the BO's uh, uh, science requir requirements. So uh, for us to maximize on uh, sensitivities on, uh, on, on of the BO scales, uh, the, uh, we, we need to have uh, the dishes should be closely packed uh, together. And also uh, uh, the redshift that we're looking at is uh, 0.8 to 2.5 so that we can capture the the uh, the domination of dark energy at redshift of uh, two. So this translates to a frequency range of 400 to 800 megahertz. So um, the BL scales um, the BL scales have an angular scale of 150 per sec, and this uh, translates to a uh, to three to uh, 1.3 degrees within the uh, IRAX uh, redshift red, red of uh, interest. So for us to de detect these BL scales, we need a minimum baseline of between uh, 15 to 60 meters. And because the BL uh, signals are quite weak um, in the range of 0.1 uh, millikelvin, mi mi we, uh, we plan to have a very low system uh, noise temperature 
and also to have a large collecting area. So this is actually why we have 1,024 dishes. Yeah, so this is a, a table that describes um, the RX instrument specification. RX is an interf interferometric uh, array. Uh, the number of dishes of say dilates 1,024. Uh, the type of observation uh, that we, we plan to do is a drift, drift scan. So we'll use the rotation of the earth uh, to our advantage. So in the east-west direction, so that we can perf perform observations. Um, the frequency resolution, resolution is 390 kilohertz. So this one is brought about by the fact that uh, our bandwidth is uh, 400 megahertz and uh, the, edit, the digitizer we're using has got 1024 channels. So the field of, of view we're looking at here is 15 to 56 uh, degrees squared. And uh, the resolution that we're looking at is 5 to 10 uh, arc seconds. The system temperature that we plan to achieve here is uh, 50 kelvins, and our focal ratio is uh, 0.25. But I think uh, this has changed uh, recently, uh, and there's some simulations going on to, uh, to back up. So it should be 2.23. Uh, so our collecting area is uh, 28. Uh, thousand uh, meters squared. Uh, so sensitivity that we plan to achieve is a 12 micro -yansties. So this is determined by the, by the radiometer equation because uh, our integrating time is, um, is around 10 seconds. So um, this is what we have. Uh, this is the current uh, dish uh, installation at a trial. So we have eight element of the shelves uh, satellite dishes. I think so the focal ratio is 0.38. So um, the problem with this uh, re, uh, focal ratio is it exposes the, 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 front, the feed uh, uh, for things like uh, crosstalk with the neighboring uh, 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 dishes. And also um, we get things like uh, spillage. Yeah, so, um, so we plan to reduce that to around 0.25. So that's why uh, in the foreground there's uh, there's, there's a fiberglass that's, that was fabricated by the MMS uh, company uh, that's in Pretoria. Yeah, so at the moment we have already instrumented this uh, dish, but I think I'm going to speak about it um, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of slides. We also have a, uh, another dish. I think uh, it's a, this is a 0.25. It's an aluminum dish, but I think it's not, yeah, it's not really instrumented at the moment. And that uh, green structure you can see over there, that's our control, control room. For the final dish, uh, in terms of the dish requirements, we plan, I mean, the dish should be a six meter diameter um, uh, for cold ratio. I think, yeah, I've said, I think we, this should be now 0.25, not 0.23, so that we can minimize a cross couple between the, uh, the antenna elements. Uh, so the dish also should be rigid and stable because I'm assuming we'll be at the Karoo. So there'll be high uh, wind load uh, so that we, yeah, so, so we want a dish that is quite rigid uh, so that we can achieve high level of uh, high level of baseline redundancy. So another thing that uh, we, yeah, the, the dish should be quick and easy to uh, move around. So this is something that can be done by an, an individual. Yeah, because ima I'm assuming we'll be having a lot, lots of these dishes around a thousand. So yeah, so we might have, uh, we might be limited in terms of manpower. Yeah, so if, yeah. Yeah, so the dish should be cost efficient. So something that we can afford, uh, yeah. And uh, so this is an artistic uh, impression of uh, the, the final dish. Um, so we, that's the foundation we have, that's the mount that supports the, 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 the dish. And also we have a, a receiver support. So this is a fiberglass um, column running, running through the center of the dish. So it, um, it provides a natural, uh, it provides a natural and environmental uh, enclosure for the front end electronics. And also, I think it also allows ease of uh, routing of the, of the cabling, like for example, fiber cable and power cable, uh, so that it can reduce uh, the, the levels of uh, loss, the, the, so that it can re reduce the amplitudes of side lobes within our beam. So, because this, uh, this does reduce the efficiency of our, of our beam. 
And uh, so this is the front end um, uh, electronics of IRAC. So that's, we have the RF of fiber uh, transmitters. The feed can, the feed can uh, okay, circularizes our beam and also it assists in, um, it, minim it minimizes the uh, crosstalk between the neighboring uh, uh, elements. Because the, the BO signals you're looking at are very weak. So uh, it, one thing that was quite important is we need to access um, uh, our, our, the sites that will be located. So at the moment, since you're located at our trial, we performed a RFI characterization. So the figure on your right, that's the um, RFI uh, measurements at our trial. Uh, so we did uh, measurements at four cardinal points. So you can see there is, uh, the, this site is quite, is uh, swarmed with RFIs. And then we also performed RFI uh, measurements at uh, the SKA site where, where we'll be located. So I uh, think we will be at the Sword Fountain site. Yeah, you can see it's uh, the level of RFI is, is quite low compared to what we have in a trial. Uh, the only difference is I think at around 400 megas, there's uh, some signals trying to pop out, but I think this can be mitigated with some careful design of our signal chain. So basically we will have to maybe uh, add some filters so that we can mitigate this uh, out of band signal. This is our analog signal chain. This is where the feed is located. So yeah, it detects the signal from the sky. And so this is where, uh, this, the, the LNS uh, determines our sensitivity and also it determines uh, our noise temperature. And then we have a second uh, stage amplifier that provides further, further amplification. So, and then the signal from the antenna is transported on a, an optical link into the control room. The RF of a fiber transmitter converts that uh, electrical signal from the second stage amplifier to an optical signal, which, which is then coupled into the fiber cable. So on the RF of a fiber receiver, there is a photodiode uh, that converts the sig signal back into an electrical signal which will be fed into our backend. So that's basically an ice board that performs digitization and channelization. And then we have, our, uh, we have the GPU correlator that does Fourier transform and uh, beam formation. So the analog uh, electronics of IRAX draws uh, as a current consumption of four watts per polarization because it's a dual uh, polarized um, system. And uh, the ice board consumes a power of around uh, 80 watt when it's in full operation. So this is a IRAX active feed. So basically that's the best board. Uh, so that's where most of our voltage regulation happens. Uh, that's the clover and uh, petrol antenna. And uh, you have your stem board. So the stem board supports your clover, clover petrol antenna to the best board. So, and also the LNA is located at the stem board. And also there's also some RFI shielding on, of the LNA. So our LNA is a differential uh, amplifier that is integrated into the antenna. So the reason for doing this is this improves uh, our system noise temperature to some level, and also it provides a dy dynamic range. And also I think uh, for differential uh, LNAs, there's uh, I interference uh, rejection. So this is an IRAX front-end uh, electronics using the RF, RF of fiber modules. So at the moment, we this is the version of, so we have a new version, but like a latest one for a two prototype, but uh, this version is, this version is, is planned for um, the full array. So the goodness with this design is you can stack 16 um, RF of fiber receivers in one rack compared to this is one of the old version we used to have. Yeah, so this, it, it does cons consume a lot of space. The type of fiber we're using is a single mode fiber that operates at a wavelength of 1310 nanometers. So the main reason we're using fiber uh, rather than coax is because fiber is cheap and also uh, it, it has a low loss. Um, it's less bulky. And also another thing is it does isolate your front end and your back end in case there's any, uh, you know, catastrophe like light lightning strike. Uh, and also another thing is um, 
it, it uh, reduces uh, the use of sophisticated electronics such as digitizers. I think like the old system, for example, if you go to a trial, they're using digitizers uh, that's on the antenna. So the type of laser we are using for our system is a fiber perot laser. This is because it's cost efficient and also it does a good performance for a short range of application. But also there are also like other lasers such as uh, distributed feedback. Yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the work uh, the, that I've been doing. So the main reason we perform um, this characterization is so that we understand the performance of our instrument with regards to uh, some of the RF parameters because these, these parameters do affect uh, the observed measurements at the end of the day. So one key parameter that we are looking at is an S-parameter measurement. The mode of measurements that you use to perform this is a vector net network analyzer. So some of the things that we're looking at here is a reflection coefficient. So that's input and output. And also we're looking at gain and crosstalks and isolation. So uh, the main reason for doing this measurement is to ch check the degree of uh, impedance match for your system and also to check on your amplification and also this, uh, that also things like uh, band definition. So another key parameter is linearity and the mode of measurements that you can uh, use to do that is uh, using a spectrum analyzer. So one figure of merit uh, that we're looking at is the third order intercept uh, point and uh, one dB compression point. The key thing with this figure of merit is determine the linearity of your system and also they determine the dynamic range of your system. So uh, this is a plot of uh, the S parameter of our differential LNA. So our LNA is a three port uh, uh, device uh, network to actually understand this plot you have on the y-axis that's magnitude uh, on the x-axis uh, that's uh, frequency yeah so uh, basically for 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 gain yeah that should be s31 and s32 so basically if it's a two-port system you will have s21 or s12 if your system is symmetric and uh, for your input impedance uh, your s11 and s22 so that's the blue trace and the violet trace. So you can see the, there's a poor input match, but this is mainly because our LNA was matched for noise impedance so that we can have a noise temperature uh, in the expense of, of uh, trading out on the input match. So when you look at the gain response, there is also 6 dB slope and our output match. So that's basically 33. You can see it's uh, less than 10 dBs, but I think in the design of our LNA, there's uh, an addition of an attenuator, so that does improve your output, uh, output much to some significant values greater than 10 dBs. So these are the S11 measurements of our passive antenna. Since our system is based on an active feed, but I think when we initially started the project, we used the passive feed. So the blue and the orange trace, so that's the S11 of the passive feed. Basically, it's very difficult to perform th this S11 measurement with an active feed. So basically what we are trying to do is, okay, we're trying to measure the S11 of the cloverleaf petal. So if I go back to, um, yeah, if I go back to this slide, we're trying to measure the S11 of this petal. And then, and then uh, okay, and then we, we need to transform these three-port three uh, measurements into a two-port measurements and uh, cascade that, put them together so that we can achieve this, this uh, blue and orange stress. But I think that is work uh, under progress that we are working on. So these are some of the antenna simulations that are performed by us from our co collaborators overseas. This is the beam of, our, of the RX antenna when phi is zero at uh, 400 megahertz. The beam has a maximum radiation of 33.4 dBs. Three dBs down, you get an half power beam width of around 9.5 uh, degrees. So when phi is 90 degrees, you get um, an angular half power beam width of 11.1 degrees. So these simulations were done by Elizabeth Peters. So this is a plot of uh, theta as a function of phi. 
So this, this plot is somehow misleading in that uh, if you look at it, it somehow tells you that our beam is uh, symmetric. But if you go back, if you look at this, these two plots, uh, when phi is zero and when phi is 90, I mean, you, you can see that our half power beam width is around 9.5 and our half power beam width is 11.1 degree. So this uh, plot is can somehow mislead you. So it's a, a good representation of our beam. And these are some of the linear key measurements I've performed for our LNA. So I spoke about IP3. So it's a figure of merit that tells you how good your, your system is in, in, in the linear region. If you have a higher IP3, so it tells you that you, uh, the, your system has got a high linearity and you experience, experience low harmonics. So when we injected a two -tone, for you to do that sort of measurements, you need a two tonal signal. So basically you need a sig two signal generators and a spectrum analyzer. So one of the signal generators was set at 598 megahertz and uh, the other one was set at 603 megahertz. So uh, we achieved an output IP, IP3 of 29 dBm. So that's, that's a good value for us. So and also another set of measurement is the 1 dB compression point. Also determines at which power level does your system operate in the non-linear region. So the 1 dB compression point for us at the output is around 19 dBm. Yeah, so if we get something greater than that, the LNA will start saturating. So it's some of the things to note when performing, um, testing the RFO fiber unit is, for, so first uh, you, you need to inspect the RFO fiber unit. This is basically the connectors of that unit. And also you need to um, inspect the fiber patch cable because I think most people usually, you know, when you just buy the, the fiber cable right from the shop, you assume that the the fiber is you know is working is in a correct order like in it's uh, yeah there's nothing wrong with it but uh, there's always like the urgency of you you need to inspect it and confirm that it's in in a good condition i use this vrv microscope to do that and also another thing you need to check for power consumption because i think these equipments are very delicate so you need also to check yeah uh, on the power uh, consumption. So uh, for our case, the RF of fiber receiver draws a current of around 160 milliamps. And uh, when it's biased by 12 volt, and the RF of fiber transmitter has a current of 70 milliamps when, when biased with the 7.5 uh, volts. But I think it can also operate at 12, 12 volts as well based on the design. So some of the also things you perform, some of the measurements that you need to perform to understand the performance of this unit is to check as parameter measurements and also the linearity measurements that I talked about earlier. So this is the inspection and as parameter test setup for my case. So on your right, so that's the unit, the kit I was talking about. So this is a spectrum analyzer that uh, we use in the lab. So I transformed it into a computer yeah, to kind of uh, get a display and so that I can see what's happening when I perform this inspection so that I can see what's happening on the interface of the connectors. And uh, on, for, the, for S parameter, I'm using a Rodentials instrument to characterize for the S parameters on the RFO fiber. When you do uh, inspect uh, the RFO fiber, okay, whether the connectors or whether the, the fiber cables, uh, you will get uh, something like a, a result similar to this. So you will either get a pass or, or a fail. So if you get a pass, it shows you that the connectors are, are clean and you can proceed to the next step with your measurements. But when you get a fail, because uh, I think there's some standard set of requirements that you, you have to also follow. For example, things as uh, laws and yeah, yeah, things as laws also determine whether the, the connectors are sort of working properly. And uh, also that you get like defects on the connector uh, interface. 
yeah, so if so, when you get a, a fail, you need to keep on cleaning the connector until it's until you get a, a pass. So I think that's one key thing that that I don't really sort of like while working with this uh, fiber is it's, uh, it's somehow cumbersome. Like you know, it you, you spend a lot of time cleaning. Yeah, so this is the RF uh, RF fiber uh, link as parameter. So um, I previously talked about having a negative slope on our LNA. So basically for the RF fiber, we also need to achieve a slope, but now it should be positive slope. Our RF fiber has a gain variation of around 10 dB within our, within our band of interest. And uh, the input uh, return loss is, I think is greater than 10 dB. And that's the blue trace. And also the output uh, return loss is greater than 15 dB. So that's quite good for us. So uh, I also performed some noise figure uh, measurements uh, on using our spectrum anal analyzer. So it has uh, the cap capability of um, measuring a noise uh, temperature of, uh, of, uh, of our device. Yes, I uh, apologize about the image. I think it's not really uh, visible, but uh, the set center frequency that's within our band, that's 600 megahertz. So you have a noise figure of 7.5 uh, dB. Uh, so that uh, translates to around 1,300 uh, Kelvins. Um, yeah, so, so th that value is quite high because uh, the, the, the noise figure of, of uh, the noise figure of uh, RF of fiber is degraded by the relatively no re relative uh, noise of um, uh, relative intensity noise of the laser. And on your right, uh, that's sort of the the gain that you you get between the uh, the laser and the photodiode uh, uh, photodiode, and it's around 16 dB. But I think it should be more. Unless I think these measurements were performed with the inclusion of uh, with the inclusion of an amp amplifier, because you know there are things such as uh, DC modulation of the D D DC uh, modulation gain of the of the laser, and you get uh, RF uh, efficiency of the photodiode. So you end up getting this this like a cal calculation behind behind that. So if you do that, you end up getting um, a loss of around 30 dBs. But I think if you have uh, an amplifier installed on uh, on that device, I think you will end up getting something similar sim sim similar as this. But you need to know all the you know what gain is that your amplifier. So I suspect this one was around 18 dBs. So these are the, these are the uh, RF of fiber output IP3 uh, measurements. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the image is not visible again, uh, but uh, we obtained uh, an IP3 output IP3 of 24 dBm, and uh, the output uh, 1 dB compression point it was is greater than 10, uh, 10 dB. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So the let me see. So the IP3 is yeah the 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 value is good, but I think you need uh I think you somehow need a a high dynamic range, uh, you know for things like RFI. So commissioning is in progress, uh, but so these are some of the preliminary um, uh, measurements we we obtained. Uh, so you can't really tell, tell much on this uh, auto correlation plot because of the effect of RFI. So um, we plan to do some uh, some modification on our signal chain uh, so that we can get a bit a better uh, so that we can get a better auto auto correlation plot that we can understand our beam. So uh, our co co collaborators from uh, Canada have actually, uh, okay, they're also doing, uh, they, they also have a test bed for the IRAX um, project. Uh, so so uh, that's at uh, DR, DRO. Uh, so using the DEEP3 uh, array. 
So um, they, these are measurements that they obtained recently. So you can see the um, system temperature our system temperature is, um, is about is less than 60 dBs across our band. So actually this gives us hope that we can actually achieve uh, the 50 Kelvins uh, 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 system temperature. So this is, uh, the, okay, this is the plan that we have uh, for, uh, uh, in terms of uh, modifying our signal RF over fiber signal chain. Um, so um, we plan to add uh, two filters that's between the, the feed and the, and the RF over fiber unit. So basically this is to uh, mitigate the out of band uh, RFIs. And then uh, we plan to have an additional uh, attenuators. Uh, so this helps to um, improve the input and the output match of the filters that we have just added. Um, yes, and then we need, we, okay, we plan to add um, an extra uh, amplifier that has got a higher, a higher dy dynamic range. Um, yeah, so that can provide more, more amplification. Uh, and but also another thing is we will trade off, uh, will trade off on gain our overall gain, uh, so that at least we can get some data because uh, at the trial side there's uh, there's too much RFI that I'm not sure if we will actually uh, get away with it. So to summarize my talk, um, uh, okay, we have performed a uh, we have characterized uh, LNA as parameter measurements, but we are also looking at uh, using other me measurements um, to, to, to measure the differential LNA. So uh, methods such as um, impid impedance tuner, and also we have performed uh, the um, LNA. Okay, we, we have performed the measure, we have measured the linearity of the LNA and we have seen that it has got um, higher linearity. But I think we, we have, we need to perform noise temperature measurements on this, on this uh, differential LNA. But uh, my understanding is doing this measurement is not really quite easy, but I think there are, there are methods that are sort of related to uh, characterizing the S parameter as well. Uh, of the LNA. So we have uh, character, character, characterized the RF of fiber system, but I think we need to modify uh, the, the signal chain so that we can uh, achieve high, higher linearity. So, but also we haven't performed a gain and, uh, gain and phase variation uh, due to temperature effects. So we need to uh, do that, um, yeah. So that's quite useful uh, uh, for us. And uh, based on the preliminary results from our collaborators, uh, the thesis looks quite promising. Uh, it tells us that we can uh, achieve the 50 Kelvin uh, on, uh, system temperature. So some of the upcoming um, schedule for for collaboration is so we have received funding for the 256 uh, uh, antennas. Uh, so we'll be planning to do uh, more deployment. I think, uh, so we are supposed to tr uh, to go on site uh, uh, next week, but I think that we'll, we'll, be, pl we'll be planning to do that in, in the next, uh, the next uh, one week. And then the next plan is we, before we, go to uh to, to the yeah okay the next plan is we um we plan to have a two prototype uh and dish antenna uh, that's a claren 14 so this is to um to uh, ref refine our of to refine our instrument uh and also to understand the performance of our instrument and then i think so that is scheduled for 20 mid 2021 but i think that might happen uh, towards the end of this year or uh, or early uh, next year. And then we plan to build eight element uh, arrays at uh, Salt Fontaine. So that's the, the main asset that will be located. 
So that is scheduled for 2021. Yeah, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, a S parameter. So uh, you spend a lot of time explaining what uh, the, the characterize the S parameter, but uh, <laughs> I don't know the technology. So what is the S parameter and why is it so important? <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically, let me go back to, thanks for the question. Uh, so S parameter is, is a matrix, uh, is uh, this uh, S parameter measurements, they, they define, so it's a matrix, uh, a short answer, uh, but if you look at it is, uh, if you have a two system, for example, if you, are, you have a, a system that has got, a, has got a two port, for example, yeah, depending on the number of ports. So for example, in this our case, our LNA is a, is a three port. So um, in terms of, you know, when you're looking at things like as gain, cause you know, gain is one critical thing for, for any um, uh, radio astronomy, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, in any part of a radio astronomy uh, telescope. Cause uh, you know, a higher gain, you can. I mean, with an higher gain, you can easily de de detect the um, the weak signals of the sky. Now, now that's that's just uh, the gain. And also, when you look at, so it's not always about gain. There are also things as reflection. So you don't want to, you know, perform your measurements, and at the end of the day, you just get reflections. So I think you, when you look at your data, at the end of the day, it, 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 you, it, you know, you will have uh, a corrupted data because you getting a reflections um, in, in the data. Yeah, yeah. So you you want an you, you want your um, in, in, uh, so the, the things that we look here is uh, impedance match, impedance match, or sometimes we call it. Uh, return loss, so it can either be input return loss or output return loss. So depending on, we, depending uh, with respect to, you know, if you if you if you're talking about a two port uh, measurements. So if you look at it, uh, let's say it's a one and two. So when you talk about return loss, so we, with respect to one, so that would be at the output, uh, that would be at the input. But with respect to two. That will be at the output. So you don't want to have a system whereby you'll be getting reflections, and at the end, at the end of the day, your system, your data won't really, won't be really meaningful. Uh, uh, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. So so this is a, a kind of a system noise, right? Yeah, and also I think uh, another thing is um, it it does. Okay, so system noise. Um, for example, um, let me see. So for example, um, for for our case, we you know there are things you also kind of trade off. So um, so for our case, we traded off uh, noise. Uh, you know, noise temperature for for. S11, that's input match. Um, yeah, in the expense that, I mean, we, it's something that we just kind of decided that, okay, we we don't want to, we'll throw away, uh, yeah, because sometimes, you know, when you're design, designing a system, you kind of have to, yeah, you have to, <laughs> I don't know how I can put it, but yeah, you can kind of get everything right. So sometimes you have to, <laughs> Yeah, you have to bargain and say, okay, which, what can I uh, trade off? Can I trade off gain for, for a better input match? Can I trade gain for a noise, a low noise temperature? So it's one of the thing with these designs is there's always a trade off between one thing and the other. Uh, thanks. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, if not, um, so we thank. Austin for today's talk.